Yes, I'm recording it as well, yeah. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this evening. Please, uh, please let us know who you are and where you're calling from in the chat. My name is Anthony Morrow. I'm the co-founder and lead change maker for our Revolution Colorado Springs and CD5. I'd like to welcome to the call tonight, Aurora Mayor Pro Tem and City Council Member for Aurora, Nicole Johnson. She's in Ward 3, if anybody was wondering. Denver City Councilwoman Candy Cedibaca, an original petition committee member for Denver's Democracy for the People's Initiative. Running for Senate District 23 and recently endorsed by our Revolution Weld County, Galena Nicole. Closing us off tonight will be Climate Warrior, Green New Deal Advocate, Medicare for All supporter, and did I mention candidate for Senate District 8 here in Colorado, Arn Menconi. A special thank you to Owen Perkins in our Revolution Metro Denver for helping organize tonight's event. Owen, are we ready? Yeah. In that case, the floor or um, the Zoom room is yours. Okay, I'm going to uh, share my screen with everybody and um, go through a quick uh, PowerPoint. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Um, and uh, just try to be ten, le ten minutes or less here. Um, okay. Can you see the whole um, screen, or is it cut off by anything? No, cut off. It's good. Not yeah, cut off. I can see the whole thing. I don't hover my mouse okay. up there. Okay. Um, so uh, anyway, I'm with Clean Slate now. Action, as well as with um, our revolution, and we just wanted to talk today about. Uh, the campaign finance reform that's been going on around Colorado in municipalities and nationwide in different communities and national efforts. So, you know, really quickly, I'd like to look at the need for public financing of campaigns. Um, we can get, we could spend a lot of time on that, but a real quick recent study showed that 80% of Americans, eight out of 10, felt like our um, democracy was, they were concerned about the condition of our democracy and 68% feel like it's getting weaker. And the number one reason they all gave was big money in politics. So this is one of these rare things where the people in the country are all in pretty, pretty good agreement that this is an issue. Uh, the problem has been that those elected into office don't always feel the same way. Um, you know, we have the theory in our country that it's one citizen, one vote, but it often feels a, like, a lot more like one dollar, one vote, that these seats are being auctioned off to the highest bidder. Um, the Supreme Court you know, did say that money is speech. I don't believe that. I don't know if anybody here tonight believes that. But if it is speech, if we take that assumption, then one of the goals that you know, has to be backed up behind that is ensuring that people of modest means are able to have their speech protected and presented um, along with people of not so modest means. So, uh, you know, Ginsburg, obviously a dissenting opinion on Citizens United. She said the notion that we have all the democracy that money can buy strays so far from what our democracy is supposed to be. If there was one decision she could overrule, it'd be Citizens United. Um, just a real quick look at uh, the problem from recent years, this is a few years back, but um, in, in Denver, looking at Denver races, 26% of the money in the 2015 cycle uh, came from non-individuals. So corporations made up 77% of those contributions and business packs were another, 80, another 8%. So you had 85% of donations from non-individuals coming from corporate interests. Um, and that's one of the things we're trying to combat. It's one of the things why reasons why all the reforms recently in municipalities and proposed at the state level, although the state already has it and the federal government already has it, all those proposals contain a ban on corporate donations and trying to take that corporate influence out of, um, out of the picture. Really quickly, um, you know, one, of the re one of the things we see is that this is a few years old, uh, this is back to 2014, but 94% uh, of those donating large dollars, 5,000 or more, are white in America. Um, elected officials, not coincidentally, are 90% white. There's a correlation there. Um, the population does not correlate with that. We're not seeing the population represented in either the donor, uh, donors to campaigns, um, elected officials, or candidates. 
So when we can reform money in politics and get publicly financed campaigns going, we can change that dynamic considerably. Um, here's another real quick point, is that this is a graph showing the ideal relationship we ought to have with the will of the people and the likelihood of a bill being passed. That if there's 80% support from the people, you would think there would be 80% chance of that bill getting passed. In reality, no matter what the percent will of the people is, the, uh, that blue line is about the percentage of what the likelihood of being passed is. So no matter if it's got 0% or 100% approval from the people, it's about 33% likelihood of being passed. The thing that changes it is when you get the elite representation in that top 10%, when they're behind an idea with their top 10% of money backing that idea, then we see the graph start going upwards and, and modeling what an ideal representation would be. Um, so this all you know, kind of sets up the idea of co corruption being legal in America, that um, people are getting something, you know, those contributing to campaigns, uh, corporations and special interests that can contribute to campaigns, do it for a reason. They get 22,000% return on investment. There's virtually no investment they could make that's more valuable than investing in a politician and reaping in the tax breaks that come from it. Obviously, Supreme Court decisions have played a huge role, going back to Buckley versus Vallejo, uh, actually Colorado Republican Federal Campaign Commu Committee versus FEC, Citizens United, McCutcheon. Um, all of that resulted in $3 billion influencing the last presidential election. Um, this is actually a, a schoolmate of mine and used to represent me when I lived in well, no, never represented me. I, I wasn't there when he was elected, but represented my family back in Baltimore. John Sarbanes, who um, sponsored the Government by the People Act, which became the By the People Act or For the People Act, um, H.R. 1, which was the first thing the Democratic Congress passed when they took office. But he said the American people are sitting in the bleachers of their own democracy, watching it play out on the field. We have to figure a way to bring everyday Americans out of the bleachers and onto the field of their own democracy where they're calling the plays. It's not just about rules, it's about power. Um, so I won't, uh, I won't spend too much time, I won't spend any time on Denver because Candy will talk about that. But uh, in 2018, we did pass uh, this Democracy for the People initiative in Denver. It went into effect on January 1st of this year. It made these changes and limits cutting mayor from 3,000 down to 1,000 and even lower to 500 with an opt-in and uh, in relation to the other offices along the way. Um, it's been happening all over the country. These are various cities, counties, and states with publicly financed elections. Um, I won't get into that in Denver, but uh, here, this is a map that just shows the green portion of this is um, the amount of a matched contribution and the blue portion is the amount that the city or the municipality or whatever entity is behind it puts in the public financing dollars. So even though Denver has the highest um, ratio of a nine to one match on contributions, which I think Candy will explain later, um, they're, what they're actually putting in is lower than what a lot of other comparable places are putting in in their publicly financed campaigns. Okay, I'm gonna try to get through the rest of this in about two minutes. Um, but, you know, if we could get candidates, <laughs> this thing of um, having to constantly be dialing for dollars, and if they could spend their time in their district, investing their time in their community, talking with their, their constituents, and coming away with even greater resources by talking to small dollar donors who, who they represent, how could they not choose to go to their district? Um, this is a brief shot of our website, cleanslatenowaction.org, and I'll, I won't spend time on it. It's got a lot of information on, our, we always track money for every race that we can. But this is uh, just showing you the effect of the Democracy for the People campaign had it been in effect on the last cycle. So you take somebody like Paul Cashman, who was basically outraised two to one by his opponent, Liz Adams, and Paul is my council member and a supporter of this, so I don't mind sharing this public information. But if you put it through the filter of our, our reform, he basically comes out even money instead of 
at a two to one disadvantage. In Aurora, where we're uh, working right now, Juan Marcono was almost uh, almost a two to one deficit. If we just take the reforms, just by putting in some limits of $400, Aurora currently has no limits. Juan takes the lead by you know 26,000 to 18,000 instead of being half of his opponent. And if we were able to put in publicly matched contributions, he would virtually double his opponent. Um, this is, I'll, I'll skip past this one real quickly, but I'm showing a couple quick examples of, of a few places that have publicly financed elections. New York, and what we're looking at on top is New York State contributions um, density per block. Well, this is New York City, but the top is the New York State elections and the bottom is New York City elections. And the state elections are not currently um, publicly financed and the city elections are. And you see all those darker colors in the city elections and the same thing if we look at a neighborhood, the state election on top, the city election on the bottom, same neighborhood, much darker, much more density, much more involvement from people when they have publicly matched uh, campaign finance. When their dollar becomes $10, um, they've got that skin in the game and, they've, and they're playing a part and, and they get involved at a level that they haven't been involved before. One of our ideals for a uh, publicly financed campaign is at work in Seattle. Seattle gives democracy dollars, um, democracy vouchers. So they give four $25 vouchers to every registered voter, and they can give those to candidates who opt in for public financing. And when they opt in, they say they're not gonna take any PAC or special interest money. They meet some threshold requirements. And uh, it's been enormously successful because you're, you're actually putting the funds in the hands of people who may not have disposable funds, however small you're talking about. You're giving everybody $100 um, to use on campaigns. And what happens is people on fixed income suddenly become a voting block, uh, you know, a significant block. People working minimum wage jobs become a significant block. People without homes become a significant block. And uh, candidates now are paying attention to the people who used to be really left out of the conversation. Connecticut, my last example, they have statewide campaign, uh, publicly financed campaigns. When the whole country has been at a standstill in terms of doing anything about gun safety regulations and a reaction to New, Newtown in Connecticut, um, Connecticut did react because they have citizen-owned elections. They have uh, people who made their way into office through publicly financed campaign, campaigns and look a lot more like the people they represent and they finally said enough is enough and they passed some of the strictest gun safety regulations in the country. Other things that progressive uh, legislature has passed is paid six days, raising the minimum wage, in-state tuition for undocumented students. So when you've got that publicly financed elections in there, you, you end up, you see higher turnout, voter turnout, that engagement increases. Community of, of colors become more engaged. Low income communities, they donate at a dramatically increased rate. Running for office no longer necessitates having wealth or access to wealth, and you get a more diverse group of candidates running and winning, including more women, more young people, and more people of color. Um, I won't spend time on it now because I don't have time, but if we get to a while, I'll come back. And Lakewood recently passed some fantastic reforms. If anybody wants to look at these later in the conversation, I'll come back to the Lakewood reforms. Uh, but that's about it. That's my uh, quick spiel. And I want to, I'll stop sharing my screen. And, um, and I, I think you all in. Okay. No problem. Not just for a great and informative presentation, uh, but for bringing this effort to Colorado. I look forward to working with you as we expand these efforts to Colorado Springs and all of Colorado. Here now to discuss what Aurora is working on. Aurora Mo Mayor Pro Tem, Nicole Johnson. Hi, thank you, Anthony. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Well, I wanted to um, first thank our revolution, um, Colorado Springs. Our revolution, Metro Denver, was actually one of my 
my first group said it endorsed me when I ran for city council in, in 2017 when the odds were stacked against me. And um, one of the, the areas that I talked to them that I wanted to work on was campaign finance reform, as well as addressing environmental issues. And um, we're going to be talking about some campaign finance reform today and what Aurora is doing. And then I did make a prior commitment. I'm working on an issue with the Lowry Superfund site, which is um, it, real close to where I represent. And we have some issues of the 140 million gallons of toxic chemicals that uh, are still in the ground and the impacts near our residential areas. So I am really committed to that as well. And I told them that I would participate in that meeting. So I'll just be on for about the first 20, next 20 minutes, and then I am gonna have to take off. So just wanted to let you know the reason why. Um, so we, as, as Owen had said, we're kind of the wild west here. We look at our, our next door neighbor, Denver, and the great reform that was able to get done. As Owen said, we have, we have no limits. Um, there, our, our electorate is, is also a little, a little different. Um, we've had um, quite a change in our, in our young, most diverse um, city in the state of Colorado and one of the most diverse areas in the country. Um, but it hasn't always been reflected the values of our community on our, our municipal government. So in 2017, a few of us got on and um, in 2019, more progressives and our revolution endorsed candidates um, got on, including Juan Marcano and Allison Coombs, who are council members. And now we really have an opportunity. We have the, the support, the momentum to make some change. So I'm partnering with um, Clean Slate, um, Colorado Common Cause, uh, members of our revolution to really start looking at what we can do to to make some changes and make our our government our election process much more accessible to the people. Oh, and do you want me to dive into what we're specifically working on, or sure, I'm yeah, trying to keep, you, keep my intro wanna, brief, but yeah, I think so. If you want to uh, address, you know, the need in, in Aurora and. Um, the status quo and, and the kind of changes you're looking to make there. Absolutely. So um, when I had said, you know, there's there's been some um, r a real need is when I ran actually in 2017, the weekend before the election, over a hundred thousand um, dollars from Aurorans for a stronger economy, um, but it was backed by oil and gas had. Um, put into the race against the opponents for um, my race, um, Crystal Murillo's and Allison Hills. And um, the dark money got much more sophisticated in 19 where there were actual ma negative mailers and calls and all of that. So I think the it's, it's just, it's gonna keep growing, I know it. And um, I've been on, on the receiving end of it and others have, so we really need to put in some assurances. Um, I was able to get some finance reform done um, before, before council members Marcano and Coombs were elected just to increase the notification and disclosures of how much money we were raising and spending. Um, it used to be just 30 days before the election was our, our report that was due and that was public. And so that was right around the time that ballots, mail-in ballots were released. And so I was able to shift that to 90 days, um, but we're looking at doing this like once a candidate files, having quarterly reports, monthly reports. The real goal is to have more accessible and transparent information. Um, would love public financing. I, I, I really enjoyed the, the presentation that, that Owen had and I hope you get to dive in deeper. Um, I just wanna say that uh, to paint the picture of Aurora is we're definitely different than our, our next door neighbor we are not a county, we are just a city. So 60% of our general fund, our, our revenue that we receive for the city is reliant on sales tax. So you can imagine with, with COVID-19, we're actually at a $20 million loss this year, projected $30 million loss next year. Um, and that shows some realities that we might be facing with a, a public finance option on a ballot. Um, also, our electorate, as I said, is 
is a little different too from Denver. We, we didn't even pass this last time lifting the ban on medical marijuana. It was on the ballot. I, I sponsored it. Our, our voters voted no on lifting the ban for medical marijuana. So we have, you know, it's something I definitely support and, and want to pursue in the future, but I want to give a little lay of the land as we have this young, progressive, diverse community, but they're not all the voters who are voting in these elections. Um, so with these changes, hopefully we can start getting our, our whole community starting to, to get um, more active in running for office as well as, as voting. And I know you're seeing a lot more of that kind of young, progressive, diverse candidate in Aurora over the last couple cycles, it seems like to me. Are you seeing energy from that section of the population um, in, in helping to get this off the ground? Is some of this, some of your motivation coming from a groundswell of public support? And, and does that lead to ways people can get involved either in Aurora or in their own community in starting this kind of movement? Yes, I mean, I see the, the energy from our young folks, but also, you know, I, I had a big ground campaign, grassroots campaign when I um, ran in 17, and I don't, this is not a partisan issue. People, no matter what party they are, background, they're sick of the, the money and influence of politics. So while we see the energy, you know, with our millennials getting more involved, I have to say, you know, I would knock on the door, and this is one of my, my issues that I ran on, is more accessibility and transparency and to address some campaign finance issues, that I think it really goes across across the board for this, this need to happen. And Anthony, you're monitoring questions. I want to make sure people know you can put questions into the chat or into the Q&A section if you've, any of the participants have questions. Yes, did anybody have questions? Currently we have no questions in either the chat or the Q&A. Um, well, I can, I can ask another question while we're waiting on that, but um, uh, uh, Nicole, is there, can you talk at all about the reception over the, the three or four years that you've been working on this uh, from other council members and other uh, uh, parts, people in, involved in the government in Aurora? Sure. Well, I, I'd say the, the reception is definitely like, it's about time. I mean, people are surprised that we really don't have any, any standards. I mean, we're envious even of the system that, that Denver has where you can put in a name of a, of a donor and then the report comes up to see what kind of, um, what donations they've made and what candidates they've made. We just haven't had that investment, um, one, we have to have that investment in technology. We need the capacity of our city clerk staff. I mean, there's gonna be realities of time, um, but it, it's just, it's such an investment into democracy and participation. Um, so, but I've also had people say, you're, you're gonna try to limit that? I mean, the mayoral race was millions of dollars. In, um, in Aurora, and I, I worked with um, Omar Montgomery, um, who lost the race by 200 votes, and um, it was it was <laughs> quite, I think, eye-opening to people. Of course, self-funding is always going to continue. Um, you know, we're not able to, to restrict that right now, but the, the huge amount, the first time we had commercials, um, TV commercials was this past mayoral race, so I think it really um, was eye-opening to people who just thought, "Oh, it's it's just still another small town. We are we are a growing city. We're the 54th largest city in the United States, and it's it's time for us to actually have systems in place and policies in place to to fit our the stature of our growing our growing city." Um. And Anthony, I know there's a, you got anything, Anthony? There's a, um, you got more, I want to make sure you've got, you're mute. Anthony, you're, yeah, there you go. Yeah, we do don't, don't have any questions, but we do have one comment. Uh, Marlon says, things have deteriorated since Citizens United, but theoretically, I don't get it. Why would repeal or work arounds work? Wouldn't corporate money just go to PACs instead of candidates? It just changes the rule of the game, not the game itself. And Nicole, do you want to 
Take that on. Yes. Yeah, that's an excellent point. In fact, I was I was just communicating with with Owen and our I call them our group of, our coalition or stakeholders because as we're um, working on this ordinance, I have a city attorney from the city who's like, oh, it's don't go there at Citizens United. And then I have some experts, um, even from DC and and Owen and, and Colorado Common Cause that says, you know, maybe we can can push this a little. And um, so I, I, I agree that Citizens United just made us step way backwards on, on all of this. And we may end up pushing the envelope a little in Aurora to see um, see how we can go with that. Well, thank you, Nicole, for joining us this evening, uh, taking time out of your busy day. Uh, we're so glad you could join us. Have a great evening. We're going to move on to our next speaker, uh, an original petition committee member for oh. Denver's Democracy for the People's Initiative. Here to tell us more about it, Denver City Councilwoman Candy C.D. Baca. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, happy to be here and share a little bit about our experience because it was definitely um, something I stumbled upon accidentally. I didn't set out to really address campaign finance reform. I was initially just an organizer and community working with young people. In, in a similar vein to Councilwoman Johnston, I was working on a, our Superfund site and a highway expansion three blocks from my house. And we were organizing neighbors around that and a disproportionate concentration of the marijuana industry in our neighborhood and really just kept hitting this brick wall with our elected representatives um, specifically with our city council member and couldn't really figure out our way around that person um, there was even a moment where we were discussing a potential recall and the issue was that we couldn't find even if we were successful at a recall, we couldn't find a candidate who would run instead. Um, even without the recall, we couldn't find a candidate. I spent two years trying to get somebody else in our district to run for that seat and nobody would run because the person um, that I displaced was actually the top fundraiser on council and really being groomed by the corporate Dem establishment to become mayor. This is a person who worked for Hickenlooper, um, who was very close with the mayor, and so had no, no trouble raising money very quickly. And so nobody wanted to run against that. And um, we started, we were our ditch the ditch people working on the highway expansion, somehow connected with a friend named John Biggerstaff, and then of course, Owen Perkins, and when they brought the idea to us about um, public financing of campaigns, it was kind of a no-brainer. And But in the back of my mind, I didn't really think it would actually happen. Um, John, and I don't know what role Owen had in it, uh, they had been doing some polling um, or at least recognizing the results from the polling nationally that suggested we could win it if we got it on the ballot. And so, we went, we signed the petition, we, we signed the affidavit, and then kind of just continued on with this education, this public education campaign that we had going that was rooted in our neighborhood issues, but was really about lifting the veil on the power structure. Um, and kind of talking about campaign finance, as we talked about our issues, we were able to draw people in and explain to them why we would never be able to change our issues if we couldn't change the people who were in the seats of power and why we couldn't change the seats of power if we didn't have enough money to compete and we were successful we we signed the petition in 2017 actually three years ago yesterday and in it got on the ballot for 2018 and it was kind of a surprise to our city council because I don't think they expected us to actually get it on, get enough signatures. And when they saw the implementation date, they recognized that it would go into effect for their upcoming elections. And there were some negotiations um, with, that happened primarily with Owen and city council members because by the time it, it had passed, I had decided to run myself. And so I had to take a step back um, at it, 
from doing my advocacy in that capacity. And he was able, Owen was able to work with city council to refer the, the initiative to the ballot. But what the condition was, was some tweaks, including and especially the implementation date, so it wouldn't affect the upcoming elections. So we had this major win that I wasn't able to partake in for my run as a first time candidate. Um, fortunately, I was prepared to to run the race that we had to win. I knew we had to raise um, upwards of $150,000 and had really set that goal in my mind and really knew that I wasn't planning to take uh, big donations, that I was gonna focus on people in our community. And in doing that, also educating them about the next round where we'd be able to use this campaign finance uh, or this public financing of campaigns. And so it, it was an easy fit for me. It was a natural thing for me to talk to people about because my work with young people prior had been really focused on participatory action research and participatory budgeting. And so this was an, a natural layer. And I was fortunate you know, in my race to have next to the mayor, I had the most uh, individual donors uh, we had over a thousand donors and our average donation, it was a little high in my opinion, but it had to get a little high. It was $81, but my opponent, his average donation was $368. And the totals kind of worked out the same. Um, my total was about $107,000 and his total was $382,000. And so a quarter of the average donation and about a quarter of the total contributions and and for us you know that was without factoring any of the PAC money because uh, Marlon raised a good a good question and a good issue earlier about the PACs those are going to exist no matter what and we had major PAC money working against us but we were because of the way that we were able to raise a, a, over a thousand individual donations we were also able to compel typical PAC players um, who don't participate in local races to get them to participate in local races. So we were fortunate to get um, working families. We were fortunate enough to get some unions to participate in our local races because of the groundswell of individual supporters that we were able to catalyze. So that's kind of my story. I'm really excited here in Denver. Um, we've drastically changed our contribution limits if you accept or if you decide to participate in the public financing. Our mayoral races, they go from 3,000 um, as the, the contribution limit to 1,000. Um, at large positions, clerk and recorder, auditor, those go from 2,000 max to 700. And for city council, the max goes from 1,000 to 400. And it's not free money. You have to, you have to meet a threshold for, for the mayor. You have to have 250 individual donations before you're eligible to get the nine to one match. For city council members, you have to have 100 individual donations in order to get the nine to one match. But the nine to one match is, is incredible. It turns a $10 donation into $100 or a $50 donation to $500. And, and $50 is the cap. So, you know, a $50 donation, you can get that from, from a lot more people than you realize, and that is automatically a $500 donation. So the power that we're giving to people, regular everyday people who could never put aside $500 but can spare 50, it's incredible. And I truly believe it's gonna change the game. And so open for any questions, comments, excited a, to see how it gets implemented. I've got a question for you, Candy. Um, given the, your involvement in the community before you took office and even before you campaigned, um, did you see, was it, an easy, was it an easy sell to connect people on the, the notion of big money in politics um, and how that actually affected their everyday life and, and how money 
in politics was holding up the things they cared about issue by issue by issue. Was that an easy connection to make? It was probably the, the most easy connection to make. Um, it was probably the most difficult thing to um, move people beyond though. Um, it took a really long time for people to believe that I was gonna be able to raise the amount of money we needed to compete. And, um, you know, there was a night, it was, it was at my campaign kickoff, because I ran for a really long time too, which helped. Uh, at my campaign kickoff, we, we kind of gave speeches about this and trying to compel people. My, my co-signer, Tony Pigford, he was there. Hola, ¿cómo estás? Um, no, no tiene nada. Okay. He, was, um, he was there at our campaign and uh, campaign kickoff, and we kind of explained this to people that we already had this victory because we counted this as our win. And we really convinced people that we could carry, we could build on that first win. And I remember um, an unhoused individual at the end of the night bringing me a bag of change that totaled probably about a dollar um, that that individual had collected all day. And that was really the example that I continued to use um, every step of the way with other people. And I think it compelled enough people to sacrifice their cup of coffee or their movie night um, to potentially shift the entire direction of our neighborhoods. Um, and I don't want to jump in the way if there are other questions. So Anthony, I'm sure you'll interrupt me if there are. But um, one of the things that's different in Denver from Aurora and Lakewood is that Aurora, Lakewood did it through city council. They unanimously passed their reforms and Aurora is poised to pass it through city council. In Denver, it was started out as a citizen's initiative and did go to the ballot for voters and they voted 71% in favor of it. What's your perspective now on city council of the difference in that route of getting there and if that's even more meaningful the way that it got there in Denver? You know, I think about it a lot because it's really what makes me different on, on council. I'm beholden to nobody but community members. You know, the person who gave me that bag of change is no more or less valuable than anybody else who contributed to my campaign. That person is my constituent and their needs are as important as the person who gave me the $81 or the $100. There was no heavy concentration of um, investment that would translate into a, a tighter hold on my votes or my allegiance to them. And so I feel the freest on council and, and that's always kind of been, you know, my goal in life is to make moves in my life that allowed me the freedom to think the way I want to think, to act the way I want to act. And that's what I've always wanted for our people. And so I, I feel very privileged um, to be able to, to live that truth in the public's eye and in a very bold way. And it's because of, it's because I know that, you know, I had over a thousand people who invested in me and all of them are entitled to my care and concern at the same level. Right. Uh, Anthony, I want to, you have. I do not see any questions, but I did okay. want to make one shout out to our attendants. If you have questions, please drop them in the Q&A or chat. Um, and Candy, uh, while we're waiting for that, is you have any sense of uh, now that it's passed, are there any efforts already from, you know, we, were, we did a pretty good job of beating back the opposition and silencing the opposition. Are you seeing any, um, Wakening up of them? Are they? Are they uh, any moves to try to challenge it or take it down or anything? Um, you know, I don't think I haven't heard of anyone getting ready to challenge it yet. You know, it's it's such a small chunk of the annual budget. I think it's about two million dollars annually that go yeah. into this fund, and and so I think it's imperceptible to to a lot of people um i expect it to come up in conversations now post covid but i think that it's something that i will fight 
um, fiercely to protect because I think it's the most important thing right now post COVID to make sure that we get the right people in. We got me in, but I'm one vote and most of the time I need six other people and it's very difficult to get six other people um, who are not free people, who are not free thinkers. And we need this, we need public financing of campaigns to kick down the doors and get more of those new people into the space who will act free, um, who will think freely, who will represent the greater good and not just a small few of those big donors. Right, great, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Candy, for all the hard work you uh, do and continue to do fighting for all of us. Thank you, always. Uh, next, we have recently endorsed by Our Revolution Weld County. And just so everyone knows, she was not in our geographic location or we would have endorsed her. Uh, please welcome candidate for Senate District 23, progressive champion, Galena Nicole. Hi, thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you, Owen. Uh, thank you everyone for having me on. It's such an honor. I just wanted to first um, echo what an incredible uh, number of champions you've had on this call and uh, what, what a truly remarkable and inspiring story that Candy just shared. Um, thank you for that work, Candy. It's, it's really, really cr critical. So um, a, a lot of things have been said already. I want to repeat what has been uh, offered here because as, if those are all valid points. All I want to say is um, perhaps most importantly, as someone who's just recently become a U.S. citizen, who's been this in invisible, loyal person for a very, very long time in the United States, living in Colorado for almost 20 years now, um, I definitely feel the pain of not perhaps having massive resources to invest in my own campaign or, you know, some sort of a legacy behind me because I've, I'm literally off the ship, you know, it's been, yes, a couple of decades of living here, but I don't have like serious family um, uh, reserves to, to put into this. And so, yes, my campaign is completely people funded and I absolutely 100% support public finance, finance campaigns so that you do, as Candy was just saying, represent the vote of your constituent, the voice of your constituent, instead of being bound to industry or that large donor and feeling like you owe them something, you owe them a particular decision, a particular coloring of your opinion. Instead, you can be that free thinker. So yeah, my campaign contributions average at about $67. And I am proud of that. I think that it's, it's wonderful to be able to really receive based on the values that you represent. And the same happens with the endorsements. Again, as a very, very recent person in the race since February, I've only received some endorsements and I've reached out to very specific groups that literally stand for the values that I uphold. So for me, it's a great honor to be endorsed by our revolution team. So yes, I think that public finance, publicly financed campaigns um, are the way, is the way to go and we must fight for it in every way possible so that if we can create funds such as in Denver, in other places so that we can support our, our candidates in the way that is a representative of the values of the constituents and actually offer them a fighting chance it's it's crucial in fact i've been invited to contribute on this call with a specific story that pertains to my district and the story um, has to do with of course a very unknown story by now about the school in Weld County in Greeley specifically called Bella Romero. <laughs> and this is this story is so scandalous it's made the New York Times. Um, we basically have seen a um, a county that in my multi-county district because we have Broomfield, Larimer, Weld and then slivers of towns, we have seen this county depend uh, terrifically on the work of and and contributions from oil and gas so much so that I now want to share my screen screen with you and maybe demonstrate real brief uh, briefly uh, what it looks like. So um, uh, the current county commissioner who is in uh, in this district, and I don't know if you can see everything really well because my, um, my uh, I don't think everything, anything, <laughs> it's good, it's not obstructed. Okay, good. Absolutely. So Barbara Kirkmeyer is the person who sits in charge of it, and she's basically very proudly waving the flag of saying that, oh, our county will not be impacted by the current crisis and post-COVID uh, economic 
uh, consequences because we have these massive um, contributions that have been already submitted by the oil and gas, and we basically are not going to fill the hit until 2022. And so well, what we're finding is that, take a look at this, 90% of the district's budget comes from oil and gas property taxes. And it's massive. And if you think about this industry, we've all know this boom and bust and bust and relying on this is not the best of the ideas for a number of reasons. Um, environment being one of them, of course, in major ways. But just uh, looking at this level of contribution, you can guess and guess the right way what kind of voting this official has been doing. And in fact, the voting score for Barbara Kirkmeyer is about 8% on the environment. This means that literally out of all of the bills that were pro-environment that were in the House and in this and later, some of them made the Senate, some, some of them did not. They died through various committees she voted no on, including things like electrification of cars, you know, obviously all of the bills that would, uh, for example, demand that our oil and gas operations report properly, you know, submit to some air and quality control uh, questions and such. So this is just an indication how money can impact things. But going back to the Bella, Bella Romero school situation, I want you to think of it this way. It's a, it's a highly controversial situation where in 2013, a specific oil and gas company got a permission to <laughs> permit to uh, put an oil um, aside, a pad, uh, right next to um, a different school, um, a school that I believe was, um, was called something Academy, um, um, a school that was basically in a district that was mostly, um, uh, mostly controlled by very Caucasian, very well-to-do families. So, so kids of uh, a different sort of social economic strata went over to that school. And those parents raised a serious uproar about it. And suddenly the permit decision uh, went on hold. Three years go by, somebody purchases that company, a different oil and gas company, and it's called Extraction Oil and Gas, E-O-N-G. And by 2016, they get a new permit. And this new permit places a pad about 686 feet from the school, the Bella Romero School, it's an, ele an elementary. And the most interesting and controversial thing about it is that that school is primarily Latino. It's, it's, it's basically kids of the families of immigrants, low-income families, Latino families. So there is a real serious racial component here. You don't have to go into any conspiracy theories to realize that the placement of this new pad literally happens to be in, in, the, in the position, in geo, geo, geographical position, where people who live around it do not have the resources to contest this decision. And so as a result, a major racial question comes up, a major social social justice question comes up for many people. In fact, there, there's a, a legal procedure, um, proceedings against, their, uh, against the commissioner on this decision precisely for those reasons. So the intertwining of money and our political officials, leading political officials who get to decide on how a particular region, municipality is going to align with which values, with, with what kind of standards, how do they uphold or not the values of life, of health, of well-being of their constituents, in this case is solely 100% dependent on whether or not this official is in the pocket of the industry. And you're looking at an example of one official who is 100%. So yeah, I'll stop myself there. I can talk about this for a long time, but I wanna be respectful of everybody's time here. So feel free to ask questions. And are there any questions for Galena? I know she's got to uh, jump onto another call with Weld County here pretty I've quick. quick. I've got a quick question if I could. I don't wanna interrupt if somebody else had one. But uh, um, I don't know if you mentioned, are you running against, are you in an open race, open seat? Are you running against an incumbent? And whoever your opponents are in the primary or general, um, how are, are you distinct from them in your policy on, on the kinds of the way you fund your campaign versus your opponent? I think you're on mute. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Thank you for asking this. Yes, I actually am opposed in my primary. And I think for my district, which has been historically Republican controlled, it's actually a really wonderful thing because all of us can bring out our supporters and rally up behind the strongest candidate ultimately will strengthen whomever the Democratic Party will uh, elect to, to nominate for the general election. So yes, I'm opposed by um, a Johnstown uh, uh, candidate, a fine woman, Sally Bocella is her name. And I think she, she would make a great statesman. 
I can only argue for myself and I can say that uh, maybe unlike my opponent, I don't run on a platform of previous accomplishments. Instead, I'm running on a platform of what I will do once I get in office. And those are very specific solutions. I put forth specific legislative ideas. I literally post them on my Facebook and in other places so that people can see exactly the kind of thinking that I'm putting together into the legislative action that I would like to rally up the support of the supporters behind. And so these are very progressive values, values that support things like decoupling our state tax from the federal tax, supporting Proposition 271 and creating graduated income tax, expanding our taxing district to the include Douglas County so that we can actually pull in millions of dollars from the wealthiest county that hasn't been contributing any tax so we can actually improve our infrastructure. So lots and lots, but um, I am a very strong environmentalist, a lifelong one. <laughs> I'm committed to the values of our health, of our well-being, I'm standing up for the recently fired Detlev Helmig and at the University of Colorado because our air quality demands action. So I am the kind of candidate that is not in the pocket of anybody and I will fight tooth and nail for the seat. And you better believe it that I'm a really strong candidate for the seat. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Galena, for joining us tonight uh, during your busy day. And uh, good luck on your next call. Thank you. Guys here to uh, close us off tonight. Running for SD8, the uh, advocate for the Green New Deal, Medicare for All, progressive champion, Arne Menconi. You're mute, Arne. Let's see what you Can you hear me now? Yes. And yes. Hi. Um, can you see me? No. Nope. Hello? Don't see you. We do not see okay. you. Can you start your video? There we uh, go. Oh, see you now. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that. I did this off of my phone. Hi, everyone. I'm Arn Menconi, and what a amazing panel. Um, this has been a very detailed conversation. I'm up in Western Colorado, in Carbondale, Colorado. I'm running for Senate District 8, which is eight counties. It's Garfield County, where I'm at. That's about 40,000 people. Summit County, which is around 25,000 people. Route County, about 15. And Real Blanco, Moffat, and Jackson, uh, to give you an idea, in Jackson in the primary four years ago, 55 Democrats voted. So um, I want, I guess what, what I was thinking about as I listened to everyone speak uh, is one of the first things that I thought of is when I, I've been in Colorado for 30 years, I turn uh, 61 tomorrow. And um, I've worked on my first campaign in 1976 in Illinois. I ran for uh, town council in 1996. I've worked on at least a dozen campaigns. I was a former county commissioner. Um, and I, I think in the first article, I ran upstairs while we were talking and tried to find an article from my high school paper where I was screaming about campaign money in politics in the 1976 election. And so we know that we have the best bought government in the world. Uh, Mark Twain said it. Um, we, the other thing that I could lend some perspective on is the distinction from maybe rural Colorado. Because when I ran for county commissioner and won in 2000, I had to raise about $15,000 the first time. There were no limits. I think recently, somebody correct me, they just created limits on county commissioner races. I've run for US Senate in 2016, um, and I ran in 2018 for US Congress, so I have experience with what it's like to actually be a canary in the coal mine running for federal seats, local seats, and now I'm running my first state uh, Senate race, and there's a limit of $400 for every donor. And as you go through, and uh, and I was, uh, yesterday I was endorsed by the Sunrise Movement, so I have, and I've only been arrested five times fighting for climate and social justice issues in 
in Washington, D.C., and most recently at the state capitol at the state of state of address, is that um, whole idea of how much money is influencing everyone in, in politics. But I, you, you don't necessarily see it the same way um, I would have thought. For example, in, in my race, I spend as much time as I can trying to raise $10, $50, $100, so that I can raise a finite number of dollars, 15,000, which is about the same amount of money that I had to run with 20 years ago to win a hard fought battle against a multimillionaire. But what we're also seeing is um, people financing their own uh, campaigns. The best example is Jared Polis. He, dunked, he dropped $25 million in his most recent campaign in 2018, and it cleared out a very, very competitive field. We saw, we're seeing the same thing with John Hickenlooper in a state Senate race that Galena was talking about and I talked about. If you go to Tracer and you look at the numbers that were just posted most recently, most of the dollar amounts that you're seeing raised right now from a Democrat is around ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, not spending a lot. Um, uh, I, I believe, uh, Chris Henson has raised... Uh, $75,000. I don't understand how um, he got that much. He has 30000 on hand. And again, the reason I kind of explain that is so people could get their head around in real dollars, because, you know, that's uh, $15,000 and Arn is winning a progressive seat primary on June 30th, and then moving on to a general that costs around 100 thousand dollars to two hundred thousand dollars so how would you influence those type of races well i'm not necessarily seeing um you know the the kind of corrupt type of things that i saw growing up in on the south side of chicago where everybody was on the take all the politicians were dirty you know you were it's normal to be reading in in illinois politics where four of the last five governors went to jail um, it's easy to read about corruption and politicians on the take, but in Colorado, you you have lived here 30 years. So we're all political wonks. You don't see these stories that often. And there's an old joke. That's because it's easy to buy off a politician in Colorado. All you have to do is take them out to lunch. Well, you touched on some things that I think are important to kind of wrap wrap up with. Is you know you have dark money. They're buying mailers. You know, it costs about five thousand dollars in order to buy a mailer in order to um, get uh, 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 10,000 people, and I need 6,500 people to vote for me. So I wouldn't know, opponents won't know, if people are doing those kind of things. It, it hasn't historically been showing up um, in races on the West Slope. So uh, what you're seeing on the West Slope is like James Oasino jumps in the the U.S. Uh, Congress race in CD3, which is West Slope and Pueblo. He's seen as somewhat of, and I'm endorsing Diane Mintz Bush. He comes in with his own money. He's going to self-fund it. He's got Ken Salazar on his side. He's got former uh, county, uh, uh, former state legislators on his side. And so that's how things are getting influenced as I see it. How you write laws about, we're, we're kind of running out of time. Galena touched on some of it. Candy touched on different things, public financing. You know, I'll just wrap up since I got the, you know, two minute warning. And that is, you know, we, we're in a post COVID legislating era right now. This is what what's happening is the oligarchy from the top down is taking everything they can in this empire that is declining. And the rules are always written for the super rich. And what progressives are like us are trying to do is just get elected in 2020, when you're see, gonna when Hickenlooper's already raised seven million dollars, when a state senator's got seventy five thousand dollars. But we could do it with ten or twenty thousand dollars to do what Candy was talking about. And I know what it's like to sit in the seat of power as a county commissioner, get one vote, and spend millions write legislation. And I was not 
I did not have to do anything for anybody who got me there, just like Candy did. And we've got to focus in the next 40 days on those types of things because politics is about winning in order to talk about change. Thank you. Can, can I jump in and make one quick comment, Anthony? Yes, go ahead. Uh, because you've raised the county commissioner mentioned, um, uh, Emily Sirota, uh, uh, our revolution endorsed candidate, did pass that county commission uh, campaign spending limit uh, last year, which put limits on that race that never had it. This year, she put it past it where it got went on school board races where they've never had limits and now they have limits. Aurora is kind of the last frontier without limits and we're trying to get limits there. Um, Stephen Woodrow, who was appointed by vacancy committee to fill Chris Hansen's seat, um, introduced the bill this year for statewide public financing. So the progress is moving along. Uh, in, uh, at levels and levels and statewide, uh, we're getting there. Um, but thanks to Arn for your years of fighting, and I hope we can help you in your race. Um, I'll, I'll you. yield now to anybody else. And did anybody else have questions for Arn? Arn, do you have any um, phone or text banks going on that we could um, let the uh, attendants know about if they're interested in getting involved with your campaign? Yes, uh, Brian Sundow is a Bernie delegate for National is running our field operation for phone banking. You can email me at arn at arnmenconi.com or arnmenconi.com and we could get you making calls. We've made about 500 already. And Arn, at the risk of asking the obvious, um, a your, your, couple of your top issues seem to be Western Slope uh, things that people in the Western Slope would care about, the Green New Deal and Medicare for All. Is campaign, are, are, is special interest money playing any role in keeping us from having progress in those areas? Well, it's more nuanced than that. Today yeah. I was called by the AFL-CIO and they, they endorsed my opponent because of my Green New Deal and that brings money in. And I was very candid with them. The reason you said this to me is because I said, they said, well, you're trying to save the planet. I said, no, I'm trying to tell you that the Democrats are gonna to try to force feed austerity on you and we have to do a wealth tax and we have to fight together to get jobs transitioning off a dying industry. They're telling me they wanna protect electrician jobs at utility companies and uh, pipe fitter jobs. You know? So is that, I don't, I don't like, I, it's not corrupt, it's not unethical, but, that's how they're putting the hand on the scale in a primary where I'm the top progressive in the state possibly who could flip a seat. Right, thanks. A thanks happy birthday. Andy. Thank you. Tomorrow we have three shows. Any of you want to be on it? We've got a morning sh show with uh, Jonathan Singer. We've got an afternoon show. We're talking about disparity and inequality, Green New Deal, healthcare. And the evening show is by Arna Corona, $10 Corona and we'll try to have some laughs about how crazy things are. Thank you. Thank you, Arne, that sounds great. Any last call for any questions? Well, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap it up. I wanna thank everybody for joining us this evening. Um, thank all of our panelists for some great conversation and bringing up some great information. Uh, I wanna put out a shout out to all our attendants. You know, we're gonna be trying to work toward campaign finance here in Colorado Springs. It's gonna be one of our revolution's uh, key issues that we're gonna be turning our focus on as we move into the summer. Uh, with that being said, guys, thank you so very much. Have a wonderful evening and stay safe out there. Good night. Everyone have a happy weekend. Thanks. Get outdoors. Great, take care. Bye.